Uh, great are you? Or what year? Sorry. Uh, senior. Senior. Junior. Seniors, juniors, any freshmen? Sophomore. Excellent. What types of things are you interested in? What kind of, what kind of business? Computer, software, anything? Still just think, figuring it out. Well, when I was when I was a sophomore here at Utah State, I actually came up with the idea for health equity. And back then, I didn't know the name. I knew it was some sort of concept where I could get more people health insurance and get more people engaged in how they spend their health care dollars. And I, I remember I was over in Old Main, had a, had a class from a professor named Reed Gertson. Has anyone ever had a class from Reed Gertson? I think he may be, I think he may be retired. I checked in with him a couple years ago. But the, the class was, on, it was called Medical Sociology. And what it asked the question was, is why in the United States do we spend more on health care than any other country per person? And yet nobody's really satisfied with their health care experience. I mean, most of you don't have to go to the doctor much, I'm guessing. But when people get a little older and they start to have other medical problems, they have to go more often. And you'll find that most people have issues with, with the way it's all delivered. The, any of you, have you ever had to pay a copay before? What's a what do you what's a copay? Anyone know? What's the definition of a copay? It's the money you pay up front. So it's a fixed amount. It's like usually like ten, twenty bucks. Maybe. Yeah, ten or twenty bucks can be higher now. Now copays, if you go to the ER, it can be fifty or hundred bucks. It's a fixed amount, regardless. And so you could get a, a CT scan or or a CAT scan that might cost. $2,000 and you might only have to pay a $50 copay. So it's a fixed amount, right? Uh, what's, what's coinsurance? Does anyone know what coinsurance is? Is that working? And I've got a plug here too. If you, I may lose. Anyone know what coinsurance is? Have you ever heard of the 80-20 rule? where the insurance company pays 80% of a claim and you pay 20%? Yeah. That's called coinsurance. And you're both paying it. What's a deductible? Does anyone know what a deductible is? Is it how much you have to pay up front? Like so for your $5,000 or $1,000 before they start paying? Right. Has anyone been in a car crash in this, in this room? OK. Was it your fault? Yeah. OK. Do you know what a deductible is? So you get in a car crash, and let's say there's $5,000 worth of damage, but then you have to pay the first $500. That's your deductible. Does that make sense? So it could be $5,000, you have to pay the first $500. Different than a copay, because a copay typically you pay every time you go to the doctor. So all of these things kind of play into, into what happens with health care. Now, what's happened to copays and deductibles and coinsurance over the last several years? Gone up. Why have they gone up? Rising healthcare costs. That's right. So costs of healthcare have gone up. What, do you know what percent the cost of healthcare has gone up every year? Like four and a half percent. It's actually higher. No, if you if you take the kind of the, the last ten years, the average is is eight percent a year. So good guess. So who knows the rule of, of what is it? The rule of sevens. When you're talking about increasing your portfolio, how does that work? It just doubles every seven. Yeah, if, if, you're, if it's going up by 10% a year, and it, ever after seven years, it doubles. Why is that? Because it compounds, right? Because let's say you owe somebody ten. Let's say you owe somebody $100, and thankfully your student loans aren't quite 10%, right? But if you owe somebody $100, and it's a 10% interest rate, how much do you owe them next year if you don't pay any principal? 110. But then the next year. You now owe 10% of 110, so it goes up, right? It compounds every year. So after seven years, it doubles. So that's effectively what we've seen in healthcare. So I want to show you just a couple of slides that might make sense to you. Just hold on one second. You want to you turn down the lights just a little bit? Okay. Just, this is our, by the way, this is our company, Health Equity. Draper, Utah. Uh, we have about 700,000 members 
that we do business for, about 11,000 em, em, employers nationwide, okay? And we're, a, we're actually the IRS uh, licensed custodian and, and have over $400 million in, in deposits. But I just wanted to kind of show you a couple of slides that might resonate with you. So if you go back to 1999, and this is a combination of small firms, so small companies, three to 199 employees, and then large firms that are 200 plus. This is what's happened to their premiums. Now what's a premium? It's what you pay for health care each month. Okay, so every month you have to pay a premium. So these are annual premiums. So back in 99, it was about $5,800, let's call it you know, roughly you know, $5,700 between the two of them per month, or per year, per year. What is it now? 13704 So 10 years, it's gone up by a factor of, what, 2.3, 2.5, like that. And that's because of this increased cost. And so what have the, what have the firms done to try and do it? They've, they've tried to increase some of those other things. Here, here's another way to look at it. Uh, Firms of, of since 2000, this is just one year later, the 10-year the, the period, it's gone up 114% over those 10 years of what the companies have paid for. But what have the companies done? Make, Make the workers pay more. So the workers have had to pay 147% more. This is, in, this is in the premiums. They have also increased the co-pays and the other things as well. Um, now... If they were paying you 147% more over those 10 years, then you could probably keep up with it, right? But they haven't. So who knows what the consumer price index is? Anyone? That's a way to track inflation. Right, so it's, it's kind of like inflation. It's saying, what are the prices that consumers have to pay for over the years? So gas, food, staples. So if the consumer price index went up by 147%, it means that your pay would probably have increased by 147%, but it hasn't. In the 10 years from 99 to 2009, the, the CPI, the dark, the dark uh, box there, went up between the two about, what, 26.5%. And what was the combined health care increase during that same period of time? 106%. These are different studies, but similar. So healthcare costs are going up dramatically. CPI is only going up at about 3% a year, or less, 2.5% a year. So these are big problems for America. So, and there, there are some other slides here. I just wanted to point out a couple more. This is, remember we talked about premiums. Workers have to pay 147% more in, out of their paycheck for premiums. They have to pay higher co-pays. They have to pay higher co-insurance. Used to be that once you hit your deductible, the insurance company picked up the rest. Now they only pick up 80% of the rest, up to a certain out-of-pocket max. Uh, someone mentioned that the co-pays have gone up as well. Higher deductibles and higher out-of-pocket maximums. If you look at this statistic, it says the percentage of covered workers enrolled in a plan with an annual deductible of $1,000 or more, means you have to pay the first 1,000. From 2006, it was only 16% of small firms. Now it's over 40% of small firms have a higher deductible. So these are the kind of things you're looking for. Now, uh, it sounds like a, a portion of you will be going into the job market in the next couple of years. Uh, obviously, the most important thing is how much they're going to pay you, right? That's the first thing you ask, isn't it? One of them. What else do you ask? what it's like, so I'm going to like it, I'm going to be Yeah, stuck quality of life, what am I going to be doing, right? Do I like the people I'm working with? And I can guarantee if you're married, your spouse will ask what are the benefits. Because what do most people do in this country, right? They go to college, they get a bunch of debt, they go out and get their first job, they get married, and then what do they do? Kids. Start having kids, right? So then they start having more debt, right? And so one of the first questions your spouse will ask, in fact, the number, the number two reason why people work at a certain place behind how much cash are they paying me is what do the benefits look like? So employers are trying to deal with all of this stuff. 
And so anyway, this is an entrepreneurial company or, or class. Let me just tell you a little bit about the history of health equity. So I'm over in, in Old Main, and I'm thinking about this idea. And it's like, well, how can I project out 10 years or 20 years? What's going to happen? And, and by the way, uh, the cost increases that I showed you was in 99 from coming, coming up through last year. When I was thinking about this, it, it was about 1990, so it was about 10 years before that. So I'm an old guy. So, so this was like 20 years ago. Okay. So I was trying to project 20 years from now, what's this all going to look like? And I just kind of drew a simple bar chart graph, and I said, well, if it keeps going up by, by 10% a year or 8% a year, it's going to be two and a half. So actually, I, so I, I'm not saying I'm a great prognosticator, but I actually kind of nailed it. And I said, all right, now what if people could go to a different type of health plan? Now, tell me what happens. Any of you have to pay your own car insurance? OK, a few of us. OK, what happens if you don't like your premium? What do you do? Shop around. So you listen to the lizard or the, 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 the gecko, right? And what does he say? I was lifting weights last night, and he says, 15 minutes can save you 15% or more on your car insurance. And so you may shop it around. What if you're really happy with the company and you've shopped it around and you think the rates are okay with that company, but you just want a better deal? What do you do? So you put a little harder sell on them. And, but what about within that company? Do they give you options? Um, I think we get very good grades. We good grades? So good grades. Um, Anything else you can do? Take class. So you can, you can try and exhibit better behavior, right? Uh, in our last, we were with some master's degree folks in our last session, right, Dave? And they, they actually came up with big words like moral hazard, right? You decrease the moral hazard, meaning you actually start acting like a responsible human being, right? <laughs> Maybe your rates go down a little bit. But there's another thing you can do. This is simple math. You can say, I want a higher deductible. So if I get in a crash and it's my fault, the question is, is how much has to come out of my pocket before, before my health insurance, or in this case, my auto insurance kicks in? Now, I can tell you that if you, if you, most auto insurance companies, if you go from a zero deductible to a $500 deductible, they'll drop the rates about 10%. And if you go up to a $1,000 deductible, they'll drop them another 10%. Why do you think? What are the factors that they're thinking about? And why they would drop it that much? You're kind of taking more responsibility for your actions in a way. Like I would think, if someone said that, I'd be like, oh, they're they're going to be more cautious because they know it's going to come out of pocket. Yeah. So that gets back to your behavior, your specific behavior change. What else? It decreases the asymmetric information. So the types of people who will likely increase to a thousand dollar deductible are the people who likely have a better driving history, anyways. Right, because they're thinking I don't get in that many wrecks, so I better. So it's kind of like in healthcare, uh, I was just walking across campus with Lisa, and she said, you know, we never even use our health insurance, and yet we're paying two, which, 240 bucks a month. It's crazy, right? So she might be somebody, if she never gets in any wrecks, well, you know, why am I paying all this auto insurance? Well, okay, I've got a risk that if I do get in one, I'm going to have to, and it's my fault, I have to come up with $1,000, but since I don't get in any, I might as well go for the higher deductible. So you're right, it's a, there could be a little bit of a selection bias, for more health, more lower risk folks. What else? I mean, simple math, right? If I'm an insurance company and car crash happens and I don't have to pay until you pay the first grand, and what percentage of car crashes are less than 1,000? Probably some percent, right? And even the ones that are 2,000, I don't have to pay the first 1,000, so it's just simple math. That's, the other, that's another point. And then there's this thing that happens in, in auto insurance. How many of you have been in a wreck and you call your parents and he says, did you call the cops? Or, um, uh, don't turn it into the insurance company. We'll just pay for it. Why do you do that? So they don't increase the rates. Right. So the insurance companies know, look, if I got a $1,000 deductible, this person's probably going to be more inclined just to pay for it and not turn it in because they don't want to increase my rates, right? All these are possibilities that happen. And so, so what happens? Now, let me just check time. How long is the le lecture? 
twenty after the class ends. Okay. End a bit so we'll leave. Time. We'll end in about twenty minutes, and we can ask questions. Okay. All right. So here's the model. This is the idea I came up with while I was a student at Utah State. It was why don't we go out and find insurance companies that would sell health insurance under the same premise? Because all those still those same things apply, right? Because if I got a bunch of people that rather than having first dollar coverage, so every time they have a sore throat, where do they go? Logan Regional. Why? Well, because I didn't want to wait till Monday when my doctor was there. Why not? Well, because I got a big weekend ahead of me. Well, how much do you think an emergency room visit costs relative to a doctor's office visit? It's a lot more. It's like 10 times more. Because you're paying for all that fixed infrastructure, right? You go in there, the ER people see you, they're up all night, they got to charge more. And it's a great place to go when you have a real bad problem. So I, in kind of my, my, my uh, alternative life, I need to say it carefully, and in my other life, I'm a, I'm a trauma surgeon. So people get uh, you know, shot in the chest, kicked by a cow, a couple weeks ago, I got a call from a guy who had been kicked in, kicked in the back by his cow. He had a busted spleen, had blood in his urine. That's the kind of stuff I deal with in, in, on the weekends. Those people, where should they go? To the ER. But you know what's pretty rare? Has anyone ever busted their spleen in here? I don't know if he raised his hand back or not. I can't tell. Very few people have busted their spleen in this room, right? Has anyone been in a car crash here that's been, and if you, you don't want to tell me, that's fine, but it's severe enough that you should be in the ER? It's pr pretty rare, right? How many of you have been in the ER for stuff, just think about this one, that maybe you probably didn't need to be there for? So anyway, this was my idea, and the thought was is maybe we can figure out some insurance companies out there that would be willing to give a higher deductible. And then I started looking at the law there was a law passed in 1996 called the HIPAA law. Does anyone ever hear of HIPAA? It stands for, you know, you know what it stands for? Health Information Portability and Protection Act. And, and what does that say? It says you've got to protect people's health information. But there was another little piece of the law in HIPAA. And it said that people could start to buy higher deductible policies and if they save money, you know, 10 to 20% money you save, you could put that into a health savings account. Back then they called it a medical savings account. And that you got the same tax benefit. Now I know I'm talking to a lot of folks that probably don't pay a lot of taxes. But someday it'll matter to you, right? Someday it'll matter a lot. And you get the same tax benefit that you have if you sent all the money to an insurance company as an employer. Now here's something that's just a kind of a little quirky thing with our tax code in this country. And I don't know, any of you accountants? Any of you studying accounting? Okay. So um, there's several ways that individuals can avoid paying taxes in this country. Can you think of a couple? Uh, you can have kids and you get the right. dependent deduction. Get the dependent deduction. How else? Um, education, <coughs> tuition, and things like that. You get a deduction. You get a deduction. What else? Gifts. So charitable gifts. contributions. Gifts. People can write off their tithing and things like that. How else? Work expenses, yep, so if you can, if you, that's one of the reasons why you set up a small business, you know, and if you do that three or four years in a row and your expenses exceed your income, the IRS <laughs> nails you, they call it a hobby business, so they put a stop on that. What else? Tax, mortgage, interest, huge one, interest on a home, <coughs> right? So, you know, you, 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 anyone have a house payment here? House payment usually is... You know, unfortunately or fortunately, depends on how you look at it, when you first start out on that 30-year mortgage, you might be paying $500 a month. Like $485 is either going to taxes or interest, and like $15 is going to principal, right, for the first 20 years. You can write off the taxes on your home and your interest you pay on your home. home. So that's a way to avoid taxes. So in other words, if you made $50,000 in a given year, and you paid five thousand dollars in in mortgage um, interest. You would actually adjust your it'd be your adjusted gross income would be would be would go down by five thousand dollars, right? Anyone? There's another big one. Tax deferred savings. 
So 401k, it's the biggest one. Now, what happens with an IRA? It comes out of your pre-tax dollars and tax when you draw it out of the fund. Actually, that's the 401k. So a Roth, I'm just thinking of a Roth. A Roth. I, I'm sorry, a Roth. Yeah, you're right. A Roth IRA is the opposite, right? Yeah. Pay taxes first, and then you do it. So we have all these ways to avoid taxes in this country. One of the biggest ones that people don't talk about is if your employer gives you $13,000 in benefits, right? Remember the slide up there, $13,000 in premiums a year? Your employer gets to write that off as a business expense, and you don't have to claim it as income. The average worker in this country, Dave, I, I was looking at some statistics. It was back when, remember when we bailed out GM? Oh, well, the most recent time. So the re most recent time when we built out GM, there was some statistic I read that said that the average worker, if you take every worker in this country and say, what is their, what is their hourly wage and divide it by the number of workers, it comes out that I think the average workers in this country make about, it's like 18 bucks an hour or something like that. It's something like that. The average GM employee was making $72 an hour. So it's like you have all these $18 an hour people bailing out people that are making 72 bucks an hour, right? But, but I mean, if you think about it, 18 bucks an hour, roughly 2,020 hours in a year, what's that? 40 grand a year is the average income in this country. Does that sound about right? What did, what did the slide say up here? Average family plan expense is 13,000. So people say, oh, my employer's only paying me 40 grand a year. No, they're paying you 53000 a year. You don't even see the other 13000 And even if you had to pay a couple thousand for that, they're paying you an extra ten grand. That's, a, that's like a 25% load on your salary just to cover your health benefits. That's why your salary isn't going up any faster, because they're having to dump 10% increase a year into your health benefits when you get out of the workforce, and that's why you're not getting a raise. It's one of the biggest reasons. Pretty remarkable. So that $13,000 a year is not taxable. And so what the little law said back in 1996 was is that you could take a portion of the money you spend on the health benefits and you can put it into a, an account called a medical savings account. And since that time, just started to grow a little bit, 2003 there was another law passed. It's called the Medicare Modernization Act. <coughs> sure none of you even thought about it. What it was was there was a bunch of noise back in 2003 about getting benefits and it making Medicare better for seniors. Any of you have family member or parents, grandparents on Medicare? What were the seniors all ticked off about back before 2003? The drugs weren't included. So you have all these seniors, they're all on all these anti- hyperlipid drugs and cholesterol drugs and blood pressure drugs and depression drugs and they weren't paid for under Medicare prior to 2003. Now Medicare picks up part of that bill. Now who votes in this country? No offense to the people in this room, but it's not you. It's seniors. It's seniors. And so seniors are saying, to, back then it was President Bush, they were saying, look, if you don't get us a benefit, we're going to throw you all out. And so, so Bush said, you know, I got I to gotta get something going here. And so they said, we're going to go ahead and offer seniors prescription drug coverage. Now, Medicare is a total disaster. All of us in this room will probably experience a Medicare that's much different in the future than it is today. Uh, Mike Levitt, who's, who's on our board, used to be the governor of the state of Utah, used to be the Secretary of Health and Human Services, said that right before he retired, this was just a couple of years ago when he left office, Secretary of Health and Human Services, one of the things he oversees is Medicare, is that Medicare, just Medicare alone, was $54 trillion underfunded. So if you take all these people, they're going to become, they're all baby boomers now, and they're all on their way, to, they're all taking Medicare. Baby boomers just started getting Medicare last year. Okay. By the time they all live out their lives, and then all of us try and get there, we're going to have a shortfall of $54 trillion. You know what the total gross domestic product of our country is every year? $12 trillion? Yeah. A little, little more than $10 trillion. That's five times our gross domestic product, just on Medicare. 
So, so we've got some big problems out there, right? So what do they try and do? Well, they try to get seniors more prescription drugs, <laughs> increase the Medicare spending, because they knew they'd get voted out of office. Well, there were a couple of responsible people that said, look, if we're going to do that, we need to have, add something to this law that will help. And so you know what they added to it? They expanded health savings accounts. And so in 2004, this was about a year after I started health equity, is when they started getting uh, into saying, let's start offering health savings accounts to all size companies. And so since that time, it's grown. Now, let me just show you the growth. Um, there was a couple, you know how laws get passed in this country, right? You hire a lobbyist, and then the lobbyist goes and meets with the legislators. I mean, this is exactly true. So in 2004, there were zero health savings accounts, zero people in health savings accounts. There was, there was a few people in the old medical savings accounts. I think about 79,000 people in medical savings accounts. The law passed and went into effect January of 2004. And since that time, by March of 05, there was a million people that signed up for him. And now, in G last January, we were over 10 million. And I think this January, they're projecting about, about 13 million people in health savings accounts. What's more interesting to us, since our business actually accumulates assets under management, is what's happening to now savings accounts for people that previously didn't have them. Now, you know, Americans are notoriously horrible at saving money, right? The Europeans, the Asians, all of us laugh at us because nobody in this country saves money. But in the health savings accounts, again, 2006 up to, uh, to 2010, there's $10 billion, just under $10 billion that, are, that have been saved in these health savings accounts. And this is money that people can use. And the money goes into a health savings account. And what's remarkable about money that goes into a health savings account, it can come in either your employer can put it in for you or, or you can put it in yourself. If you're single, you can put about $3,000 a year into these accounts tax-free. You can put it in tax-free. It grows tax-free. And unlike a 401k, when you go to take the money out, you can spend it tax-free on health care. Now, if you turn 65 and you've got a bunch of money in there and Medicare is actually good then, I don't think it will be, and you don't need to spend it on Medicare or dental or vision or whatever, you can take it out and spend it just like a 401k. So as you all go out, you all go out into the job field in the next several years, one thing I'm asking you to consider is to talk to your employers about health savings accounts because this is money that you can take. Uh, average time someone spends certainly in their first job and probably subsequent jobs nowadays, I've heard... 5.2 years. 5.2 years. So you, what, do you, what do you do after that? You may get laid off. You may want to go start your own business. You may want to go work for somebody else. Guess what you can do with this money in your health savings account? Keep it. Take it with you. It's portable. It's not your employer's money. It's your money. Your employer goes out of business. You got to go find another job. They don't take this money out of your account. It's your money. What kind of an interest there's two ways you can do it. You can leave it in FDIC. So the blue box are just in deposits and the green box are in investments because you can invest these dollars just like you do a 401k or an IRA. And so if right now in the current rate environment, which is incredibly low, you might make a half a percent, depends on how much you have in it, 1%, but it's FDIC insured. If you want to take it out of the FDIC insured environment and put it into the market, <coughs> Charles Schwab, something like that, then you can make whatever the prevailing rate is. In the market. Does that make sense? So the estimation is, is that by the time uh, some of our, seven, anyone on the seven-year program here? Don't, don't ask that question. By, by, the, by the time some of you sophomores that are on the seven-year program graduate in 2015, there'll be $60 billion in health savings accounts throughout the country. And I think these are pretty conservative estimates. So let me just give you a one quick case study and then and, and, and please ask questions in the meantime. So uh, American Express, name brand company uh, based in New York City. They have 25,000 employees. Uh, anyone from the Salt Lake area here? Out by the airport, there's a big American Express shop out on I-215. They have a couple thousand people that work there. Uh, most people that work at American Express are 
are working in a call center. You know, they're probably making close to that 38,000 bucks a year. I mean, maybe not a lot more than that. That's what most people uh, make. I mean, you know, if you have an American Express card, you can call 24-7. If you have a problem with the card, whatever, it's those people that are answering the phone. Okay, so they were like all other companies. They were seeing a 5 or a 10 or I think they were close to an 8% increase in their premiums year over year. Their costs were going up that, by that much. So two years ago, they came to our company, and we, had, and we were very lucky. We were kind of in the right place at the right time. It was actually three years ago. And uh, American Express had tried to do health savings accounts themselves as an offering. So you could have potentially gone to American Express and got, and re, and got your own HSA. Didn't work. There's a number of reasons why it didn't work. You know what the number one reason was, though? Only about 20% of doctor's offices take an American Express card. Most doctor's offices take a Visa card. So in order to go sign up the doctors to take the American Express card, it's going to cost them like $100 million. And initially they thought maybe this is worth the investment, and then they decided it wasn't, so they got out of the business. But this remarkable thing had happened in the meantime. Their human resource group, the people that set their benefits, had decided they wanted all their people to go out and have health savings accounts. So they're kind of between a rock and a hard place. They already decided, we think everyone should have a health savings account in our business. For what reason? For the reasons we talked about on the auto insurance. What were they? First thing is, is that you can save this pre-tax money, and it's your money. It's a better benefit. What's the other reason? People are more careful. They're more thoughtful. I've spent a lot of time in the emergency rooms over the last... 15 years, as I've been involved in healthcare and through my training and everything. And one thing I would always ask the emergency room doctors, and, and as you're thinking about new ideas, and you're trying to figure out, how can I come up with a widget or something to, to de deliver to the marketplace to get incredibly rich, right? Just ask people questions. And I'd always ask the, emer the emergency room doctors, I'd say, let me ask you a question. It'd be like, 8 o'clock on a Friday night. One time my wife, Christine, who's in Pinko there, she looks like she's a college student, but she's, she was Utah State grad, but she's, she's much younger than me. But one time my, my wife called me up, do you remember this, and you said, so-and-so, the lady that cuts your hair, um, is in the emergency room and, and her daughter thinks she has uh, a bleed, an intestinal bleed. Uh, it was on a Friday night. So I'm, I'm working in with the trauma patients, and so I decided to go out and say hello to her. And I'll never forget this scene. It was in Tucson, <coughs> where I did my training. And uh, I walk out, and the emergency room can get to be a pretty ugly place on a Friday night. Six-hour wait, people are sick, they're upset. And so I was sitting there with the nurse, and it's, it was a, a guy that, whose, whose job was to be the triage nurse. So when people would come up and say, this is what's wrong with me, he would have to decide who goes first, who's the sickest. And he was sitting behind bank glass, like teller glass. And I said, well, what's up with the teller gla ga or glass? And he said, people will actually kind of storm the, <laughs> the, my desk after they've been sitting here for five hours waiting to see a doctor. And I said, well, I was looking out there, and all these people are sitting out there, and some guy's eating a pizza, and other people are watching TV. And I said, well... Where's all the sick people? Because, you know, I was used to seeing people coming in on ambulances and gunshot wounds and everything, and they said, no, that's them. And I said, this is their family members, right? Because they don't look sick to me. And they said, no, no, this is the sick people. So I said, well, I've got to go find this lady. So I go out, and I walk around, and I find her. It turned out she was eating, like, red brownies or something like that. She wasn't even bleeding. But anyway, she was in the ER on a Friday night. All of a sudden, a, f a car, this is in Tucson, catches on fire out in the parking lot. And all of these folks that are supposedly so ill, they had to be sitting and spending their Friday night in the emergency room, get up and run out and watch this car burn. And then I'll go, I'll go back down and sit down. And I said, this is the biggest waste of time I've ever seen. How could anyone sit in an ER for five hours when they're not like having to be brought in by an ambulance? And so I started asking the ER doctors, I just asked them, what percent of the people that are here in your ER that you will see tonight need to be here? And it was kind of the old Pareto's principle, the 80-20 rule, about 20%. 80% don't need to be here. Why are they here? Well, some don't have insurance. 
But a lot do. In fact, the ones that do have insurance come just as often. And why is that? Well, because, you know, they ran out of their inhaler and they didn't call their doctor in time, and so they come to the ER and rack up a $1,000 bill so, you infly, so you'll, the guy will give them a new prescription for the inhaler. So that was American Express's perspective, is by putting everyone into a health savings account, they decrease the moral hazard. People start thinking more about their health care. They, they start spending less. They start seeing money in their HSA. They want to grow this thing. And now, the end of the case study. So American Express, last year, reported that, guess what their year-over-year -year cost increase was? It was less than 1%. Compared to all of the other companies out there that are they're a lot higher. Um, this shows you the, the, the statistic of, of how, over the last several years, poor performing companies that don't have health savings accounts are averaging about a 10% trend. Hey, thankfully it's down from 15%. Remember, this is in a time where in, de, there's, we've seen deflation and still the consumer price index is like 1.5% and there's still many times the CPI. On the other hand, the best performing companies like American Express, their year-over-year -year cost increase is less than 1%. Now, you know how much American Express spends on their benefits every year for all their employees? So it's about a quarter of a billion dollars. So if you can spend 0.3% compounded or 10%, what's the difference of that? It's simple math. It's 10% of 250 million. 25 million bucks in savings. And here's the most remarkable thing, going back to the original reason why I started health savings accounts. We do, we do surveys now with their people, and we say, do you like your benefits better now or before you had health savings accounts? You know what they say? They like them better now. So isn't that like the killer solution? If you get people that are more satisfied, that are spending less money, 25 million bucks a year less money, and they're happier, that's the kind of business you want to be in. Just a couple last thoughts. Any questions? Interrupt me if you have them. Yes? When you talk about, you said that you could invest them as well, not just put them in yeah. the savings accounts. Yeah. How do you access that when you do want to go ahead and... That's a, that's a great question. Different companies do it different ways. One of the things that we've really invested in at our company is our technology, and it's really cool. It's really cool. Um, let, me, let me just try and illustrate it to you. I could show you a demo, but the bottom line is, is that when somebody gets over $2,000 in their health savings account, a button will pop up on their website, and they'll say, do you want to invest? And the two things they need in order to inv invest in our model is they have to have at least $2,000 in their HSA, and then any money over 2000 they can invest, and, get, and then they need a valid email address. That's it. They click on the button, they do one click sign agreement, and then they're, they're taken right to a portal where we offer them a, a bunch of different plan, funds, and they can just click on those funds, and they can day trade if they want. We don't charge any fees. So it's very simple. Uh, some of our competitors, honestly, will redirect them to another website. They'll have to sign in. It's a little more, more cumbersome, a little more complicated. So we try to make it really easy. So the actual bill goes to your company? Yeah, so what the, our company, what we do is if they say, I want to invest, let's say they have $3,000 in their health savings account, I want to invest 1000 over my 2000 and this is the funds I want to put it in, three clicks of the mouse, out the door, then what we do is we take that $1,000 and we ship it over to Schwab, who actually places the trades in the mutual funds. I mean the, the, the health. Uh, like oh, oh, okay, yeah. So, so then what we do... Again, this is our technology, and this is what differentiates us from our, our, our competition. Is Because our competition is a bunch of banks, like Chase, one of our big competitors. Is We've said, look, we want to be involved in healthcare. We don't want to just do the banking thing. So when, when they go and let's say they're on a select health plan or a regent's plan or something like that, and they go and they, they actually see a doctor, the doctor sends a claim to the health insurance company because they have to figure out how much the person needs to pay. And then the health insurance company sends it to us, and then we, we actually send uh, our, our members an email, and we say, hey, there's a claim waiting here for you to be paid. And they log in and come to our website, and they can pay it. 
And then the other thing that we do that's just really cool and pretty sexy relative to our peers is we say, we analyze your claim, and if we can find a lower cost alternative, we'll tell you about it. So if someone comes in on a certain medication and, and we've analyzed it, we'll let them know lower cost. Why do we want to do that? Loyalty. loyalty. They love us. Why else? How, many, how do you think we make part of our money? It's on the, that, you know, we have almost a half a billion dollars in deposits, right? So how do we keep them having more money in their account? Two ways. We educate them, beg them, plead them to put more money in their health savings account, right? Because if they put more in, the balance goes up. How else do we do it? Spend less. So if someone's on a, on a medication that's going to cost them a couple thousand bucks a year, and we say, hey, we found a lower cost alternative, works just as well, print this thing off, send it to your doctor, he'll write you out a new prescription, and it'll only cost you a thousand a year, we, we get an extra thousand dollars that we could make some interest off of. So I think, it, I think that's one thing I would say about businesses. If you can figure out a business to do or be involved with where your incentives are completely aligned with the people you're trying to serve, where you do something and they benefit and you benefit, then I think it's a great business to be in. Any other questions? Let, let me talk just for a couple more minutes about our service model. We do 24-7. We're the only company in the, in the, in the industry that does 24-7. And you know why? It's pretty simple. When we were starting the business, I had a bunch of these MBA uh, partners that started the company with me. And we literally sat down. This is one of the decisions you're going to have to make if you ever start a business. When are we open? Now, if you're really smart, you can start a business that has no human interaction. And it's just like a really killer website where all you do is just interact with the website. And then you say, no, we're, we never close because our website's open all the time. Well, my position was is that, you know when people usually go to the ER? It's after hours, right? In fact, if you go down to Logan Regional and you hang out in the ER, you'll find that there's one doctor there during the day, and during the evenings and weekends, there's two. Because that's just when people get sick, and I don't know why. I don't know if it's that you're working all day and you finally feel like crap, and you know, I better go, I don't want to take my sick time, but now it's five o'clock at night, I finally got off work, and I gotta go checked out. I think there's a little bit of that kind of selection bias. So my position was, if someone is, a, this is their first time in a health savings account, and they're on their way to the ER, and they don't really understand how this thing works, we ought to be there to help them. So we do 24-7 service. And the other thing that we do, and this is really important to us, is we track our members. So there's a thing called Net Promoter, and Net Promoter is pretty cool. And what it says is, Net Promoter, is if you asked 100 of your members, simple question, Simple, 100 of your customers. It's the ultimate question. What's the most powerful form of advertising? Word of mouth, right? So, and that's true. Would you, would you both agree? Most powerful form of advertising is word of mouth? Okay. I mean, especially now with Twitter and, and, and everything else. I mean, if, if, you, if you have someone talking trash about you, you're toast. If you have people talking good things about you, you're good, right? So, the net promoter score, I don't know if you've heard of this before, but it's a, it's, a, it's a body of research done by a guy named Fred Reicheld, and it's the ultimate question, which is, would you refer this company to your friends? Would you, make, would you recommend them? Now, it's pretty, pretty amazing how many companies the answer is, eh, no. I mean, think about it. How many companies do you know about that if that company disappeared tomorrow, you'd even care? Or would you just reload and go find another company? Right? Pretty few. So what the net promoter score does is pretty simple math. It says, we're going to take 100 people and ask them this question. On a scale of 1 to 10, would you refer them to your friends? And if they say, yeah, 9 or 10, that's a plus 1. That's a point. And if they say 6 or negative, we think that's, a, that's actually a detractor. Those are people that won't promote them. And a seven or eight doesn't count. So that's a zero. And we just add it up. Now, the best companies in the country are companies like Amazon and Harley Davidson. Google's pretty high. Because people are generally pretty satisfied with those companies, right? 
I'm not sure any of you have a Harley, but you know, there's a few companies out there that are people who are very, Costco has a very high net promoter score, right? Lots of cool stuff for pretty cheap. Now, um, we, so we do the survey, and we are proud to present that of the, of the ones that are reported, net promoter scores, we're like the fourth highest in the country. And I think it's actually pretty easy. It's because we're just there when people need us. So this is the way we, we kind of actually track our business. And so for our, our business goals that we're putting out to all of our team members right now, in order for us to get our bonuses for, for each year, we have to keep our net promoter score higher than 70. And you think, well, 70, that's kind of weak. That's like a C, right? Do the math, though. 100 people, you'd have to have 70 of those people give you a 9 or a 10. You'd have to, give, you'd have, to have 30 of them give you a 7 or an 8, and none of them give you a 6 or minus. So it's tough. It's a very, very tough thing to do, and we're able to do it. So I think we're out of time. I think we have time for one more question, if there's any. Thank you. Good questions. So last thing is, go sign up for health savings accounts. I'm telling you, it's the best deal. And, and, and then the second thing is, is if you got an idea, chase it. You've got a great opportunity to make it happen. Thank you.